Hello, welcome to the Staffordshire University Christmas Lectures. This is the second day of our nearly week-long um, event. Um, Jamie, um, have you used Blender much? I love Blender. I'm not good at Blender, let me be very clear, but I, I use it quite often. Oh, it's a you, lovely program. I'm what do you like? forward to learning some more today. What do you like about it? What do I like about Blender? I like that the logo is orange. I feel very seen. Mm, good, good. Yeah, I, I like how it's um, you know, it's you know, free and accessible, and you can do lots of do lots of really cool stuff with it. Um, and um, we have with us today, we have Anthony uh, Martin, who's going to talk to us about um, how to become a uh, a one man uh, VFX team or a one man VFX army, I suppose, um, with uh, um, with with Blender. But you know, I'll I'll let him uh, take the stage and um, give you all of the awesome information. So without further ado. Uh, Anthony Martin. Hey, hello. Um, I'm Anthony. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, so I'm going to give you a presentation on a bunch of things. Um, it's going to be about Blender, but it's also going to be about um, a little bit of a history as well of the kind of techniques that I'm going to be using that I use to try and make my spaceshipy kind of stuff look uh, sort of old fashioned. Um, so let's begin. Um, so this lecture is going to be way more personal than I thought it was going to be. Um, it's going to be about how modern technology and a quarter of a century of me working in the CGI sort of VFX industry um, helped fulfill this little guy's sort of dreams of making this kind of stuff and making it to a quality that please myself you know just as much i do it for myself i also do it because i like the dopamine rush of people liking it on uh, on social media and uh, and friends kind of liking it but mostly it's to do with um fulfilling this kind of urge as a younger kind of kid to kind of do this kind of spacey kind of stuff um growing up as a quiet kid in like the late 70s and the 80s and 90s in northampton um someone who was occasionally kind of bullied as well, I would daydream a lot and I would think about, um, you know, escaping. I would watch a lot of films. Um, I would look around myself. That Northampton is a town in the Midlands and um, it's, I have a, I have a, I was going to say a love-hate relationship with it, maybe more of a ambivalent kind of relationship, I suppose, uh, with it. Um, people who come from Northampton, my, other than myself, uh, the famous comic book writer Alan Moore comes from Northampton, and he would argue that, and he still lives in Northampton, that Northampton is literally the centre of the universe for all manner of um, fun, witty kind of reasons, magic reasons. Uh, Alan Moore is actually a magician. Uh, my dad would take me to the cinema, maybe not every week, but uh, sort of certainly every other week, you take me to the ABC cinema on the Abington Road in Northampton. Uh, it later became the Canon Cinema. Um, the first film I ever watched at the cinema, I, never, I can never remember whether it was um, E.T. or Return of the Jedi. One came out in 1982, one came out in 1983. But I became quite a regular kind of cinema goer, and I liked kind of going. My dad took me, and it gave me, um, gave me my love of kind of films. And it gave me my love of really looking at films and enjoying the cinema experience and enjoying this kind of cinematic experience of how these things work. Because it's not just the spaceship, spaceship kind of stuff, which I love. It's the way that films are presented, the way that cameras move, the way that the image kind of looks, even the way titles work and the way that sounds and music kind of work. Um, I became very much like, a, it, it was became everything to me. I would dream of it. I would sleep of it sleep about it and dream about it. Um, these kind of daydreams uh, meant that I was watching a lot of stuff like this and a lot of stuff like this was in my uh, in my thoughts all the time. And I would study it. So this is obviously Return of the Jedi. Um, uh, this is Aliens. And these are all um, miniature effects. What you're seeing are models. And then these models are lit and then cameras are moved around them and then they are combined back together again. I think Return of the Jedi here, this motion control photography over the Death Star 2 is 
still some of the best stuff that's ever been done. The camera moves are so fluid and so detailed, and that's a physical model that the camera is kind of flying through. Um, I would watch this kind of stuff, and I would try and think, how can I kind of recreate it? Um, I would. It was a long time before my family got uh, a second-hand video recorder, um, camcorder. I had a VHS kind of camcorder. And me and my brother would make models, and I would then move the camera, because I'd seen a couple of making ofs on TV. I'd move the camera over the mod uh, models to try and get this kind of look. Um, so, yeah, I was absolutely obsessed. So I think this, uh, and I was obsessed with like the the things like the the way that the camera moved. I think things have changed a little bit, and at the risk of sounding like an old fogey who moans about modern stuff, I liked how shots could last longer back then. I think we were given more time to appreciate and look at the spacey kind of scenes. We could, um, I found it more immersive, to be honest. I liked. Uh, imagining that I was, this is from Alien just here. A lot of, you know, it's, it's a horror film, but for me, it's a comfort movie. And I would often imagine just uh, wandering around in a Stromo spaceship and just relaxing. And now we've got to the point where you can watch a 10 hour long YouTube video that's just a Stromo spaceship ambience. Um, yeah, and this is 2001. So things just moved a lot quieter, a lot slower. And I just liked the look of these kind of models. Now, the look of these things, they have, they have a certain look. Let's just uh, skip the frame. Um, they have a certain look, and it's down to a couple of things. It's down to technology and the people who are behind um, making them. Uh, this is we're inevitably going to have to get to the point that back in the day there was an awful lot of older white men who were mostly behind the looks of these kind of films. So um, it was. It was a different kind of era. Um, but these guys were employed. And what made it different is that um, the people who were making this stuff, George Lucas, people, I guess, like Ridley Scott and Stanley Kubrick um, as well, they started to use designers to design these spaceships and the, and the look of their futuristic settings, um, not using the typical in-house studio art departments that were normally used in Hollywood. They started branching out. And they started employing people like um, Ralph McQuarrie, who was actually um, an aeronautical engineering designer. Um, Sid Mead, who worked in a lot with automobiles. Uh, Ron Cobb, who was, I mean, he was a, a sort of, a, he was a satirical cartoonist as well as a, a designer who was obsessed with kind of techie kind of things. Um, he would do, Lots of cartoons he, uh, during the period of Watergate um, about um, Richard Nixon and anti-Vietnam kind of cartoons. Um, we also had people, we had illustrators we used, like Chris Foss, an illustrator slash comic book artist like uh, Mobius. These people, they weren't really part of the studio system, and so they brought a different kind of sensibility to it. Um, they would either bring very much a kind of um, functionality to the designs, um, or they would bring um, just a sort of a slightly more crazier kind of artistic sensibility that was a little bit different from the staid, drier, set in its ways kind of um, artwork that studios were using at the moment, uh, pre prior to these guys um, being used. I think, and these guys, they were designing the ships and they were designing the looks of stuff. Um, and Nilo uh, Rodis Jamiro as well, if you like Boba Fett, Boba Fett. He would design that he, that kind of character's look and a lot of the costume um, elements of the Star Wars films. But these guys would bring a different design sensibility to these spaceships. But it was more than that as well. It was also what happened once these designs were passed on to the model shop fabricators. Uh, what they would do is they would take these designs, they would um, mock up stuff um, initially, like the, the um, overall hull and the shape, uh, and then they would do what's called kit bashing. And it's something that I use today and a lot of people still use today in both in concept design, but even in the actual VFX kind of shots. And what kit bashing is, is that the overall structure and frame is kind of made. And then as you can see here in the background, uh, these are a lot 
of plastic model kits. And I think these are like uh, Indy 500 kind of kits and Formula One kits, but also a lot of uh, sort of battleships uh, were used and a lot of airplane kind of model kits. And these were then used to add detail to these relatively sparsely detailed hulls or, or kind of frames. And these were called greebles. Now, there's a lot of, there's, well, there's not a lot of, but there's a little bit of a continual uh, transatlantic rivalry and contention between who came up almost with the word greebles, but also the, the actual way of, um, of, of the, the process or the theory of kind of using it. Um, oh, I should, I forgot, to, I got to say, forgot to say, uh, if you've got any questions about this, please pop it into the chat. Um, I have got it on my third monitor and every now and again, I'm going to be looking down at that to see if anyone's got any questions. Um, initially, um, it was thought that people, uh, the Industrial Light and Magic started using it and they started using it on the Star Wars project and they were called Greebles or Greeblies. Sometimes they were called Nernies. They were just these nonsense little words or these plastic model kit parts that were put on the top of um, spaceships or other kind of models uh, to give a sense of extra scale and kind of detail. Uh, and it actually depended on whether you're working in the North Californian office of um, ILM or the Southern Californian office. And even then there would be rather about who came up with it. But at the same time, people in the UK um, were saying, well, the, as, as a lot of disgruntled chip on their shoulder, Brits would say, those damn Yanks, you know, we came up with it. And as far as I could find out, this, it looks like the Brits might have come up with it. And they might have specifically come up with it um, due to working on the Jerry Anderson super marionation tv shows uh like uh the thunderbirds and things like that um because they were i think it's brian johnston who was working for them said that uh, you know they had a lot of spaceships a lot of vehicles to make but not a lot of time so that they would um, use plastic model kits then to quickly get things looking good and even though the way that the ships move in things like thunderbirds look a little bit dated and a bit slow um I think the designs are still pretty solid, and I still think the the look of them in still frames looks really good, and they have a great sense of scale. It's only when they kind of move that they kind of belie that fact that they're on wires, um, and someone is puppeteering them overhead. Um, Louis asks, favorite spaceship? Um, uh, what is my favorite spaceship? I have a lot of favorite spaceships. I think the Star Destroyers from Star Wars will always be high up there. Um, I just think they're an amazingly simple design. They're just really like an arrowhead with a little coning tower on the top. Uh, and then the rest of them are these greebles and details. And I remember staring for ages and ages and ages and doing tons of drawings as a kid of uh, Star Destroyers um, because I was obsessed with the fact that they looked huge um, because they had all this detail. They also had loads of little fiber optics kind of um, push through them as well to make them look like with tons and tons of twinkly kind of lights. Uh, but I also love the Nostromo from Alien. I think not just the Nostromo, but also the refinery that it tows. I think it just looks um, amazing and awesome. I just love the amount of completely over the top detail that's on the underside of that spaceship. It's just uh, incredible. I watched a interview with the guys who did that spaceship and they would work with concept artists. And I think a lot of concept artists actually forget that their designs will get passed on to people in the olden days, model shop makers, but nowadays um, CG VFX people. And they don't realize that it's not like them. The design design doesn't stop with them. It carries on going. Uh, the Nostromo um, was a collaboration between Ron Cobb designing it, Chris Foss designing it, then getting passed over to the model shop studio. And they would continue to make it. And it was being added to and painted like right up minutes before they were shooting it. And um, they didn't really use motion control as much on, on Alien. Uh, the spaceships in the Nostromo are actually just loaded onto a forklift truck that then just moves slowly through against a black screen. We are a little bit more low tech in the UK, but um, I think it still looks great. Um, thoughts on the Covenant in comparison to the Nostromo? Um, Covenant spaceship, this looks all right. You know, it looks what it is. And I can't get over the fact that it's in a film like Alien Covenant, which is a travesty. Um, I actually rewatched Prometheus and 
kind of began to like it more, but I don't, I rewatched Covenant and I just was, this is like, this is a straight to video film, but with a big budget. Um, uh, would you limit yourself with kit bashing to your own asset library or do you use, like, oh, well, you're going to see this in a moment, um, Ryan. I use, I use everything. I use my own stuff and I buy kit bash kits and I get free kit bash kits and, the differences between these different type kind of things. If you buy a kit bash kit, it's more likely to have some textures maybe on it and some decent UVs. You get a free one. It probably doesn't. Uh, and that kind of gives you certain challenges. Although being a dirty concept artist, I don't really care about good UVs. I'll just slap smart UV project. Or if it's particularly complicated, I'll take it into 3D coat and UV it there. Um, or I make my own kind of stuff as well and save it. The good thing about Blender is it's quite easy to make your own asset libraries and it makes it um, very nice to just drag and drop kind of stuff in. Um, so, yeah, you use a mixture of everything. I'll show a little bit um, about how I do a little bit of a combination with good old-fashioned modeling and then using kit bashing on top of it as well. But I should get cracking because I've given myself time to um, to do the practical part. But you can see uh, things that, I mean, this is a very low-res jpeg -y kind of picture. But that this is what it looks like. Before it's painted, things look rough as hell before they're painted. Uh, but the difference that painting makes cannot be overstated, as this is a very, very close-up of the Millennium Falcon. Um, you can, there's a great Adam Savage video on YouTube where he uh, he shows, because he used to be in the model shop of ILM, and it, it, he shows exactly how you can do it yourself. And it's very, very low tech. That's one of the beauties of it. It's a very, the entry requirements to doing your own model shop greebling are very low. Um, you don't need to be rich to kind of do it. You need simple, fair, fairly simple materials. And if you find some secondhand plastic kits, you can do it. And then you get yourself a cheap airbrush, you can kind of do it. I should do it. But the problem is I have a limited amount of space to do this kind of stuff. And um, my wife is normally on the kit, uh, on the dining, dining room table when it's not being used, doing her sewing stuff with her overlocker and sewing machine. And so I can't complain because I, I can do virtually everything that I want to do up in my room. <laughs> um, Jennifer asks, this isn't a question. I just want to call you a UV heretic for that statement. Yep, yep, fully accepted. Um, I And I'm completely and utterly not sorry for it either. Um, obviously, if I was making stuff to go in a game engine or to pass on um, to a VFX colleague, um, I would be too ashamed to pass on what I do in terms of a concept and kind of workflow. Right, the next thing, apart from how the models looked and how they were made, it's how they moved. Uh, nowadays, obviously, with CG, you can fly a camera around anything super quick. There are absolutely no limitations. Uh, back when things like 2001 was being made and ILM were doing Star Wars, uh, things were a bit trickier. Up until this point, spaceships were, as I mentioned, a bit like Jerry Anderson stuff. They were on, uh, they were on literally on filaments like fishing wire and uh, and dangled from above. Uh, this caused immense amount of problems, you know, and they would run the, the camera at a high frame rate so that everything looks slower and bigger, but it was still it was still wobbling around on some wire. And if you wanted to repeat a, a shot, maybe to do a double exposure to put something else in, you couldn't do it accurately because even the best puppeteer in the world can't perfectly recreate the same movement. So um, the way ILM got around this, or they came up with the idea, and it actually was beginning to be uh, sort of, explored in things like 2001 is is, uh, is instead of moving the spaceship move the camera around the spaceship that way you can lock that spaceship off and it won't wobble and it's easier to control the camera and what you can see here is the dykstra flex or the dykstra flex dykstra flex i think um created by john dykstra who worked on the first star wars films and this is what's called a motion control camera this is a camera attached to a jib, which is that big thing, that crane. And then the jib is uh, attached to some tracks, a dolly kind of set of tracks. Uh, and then this can be moved very accurately around the model that is attached to a, um, a support, like a, a, fr um, a frame support uh, against a blue screen. Now, what they realized was, is that what if we have this, then we can get much smoother movements, but then what if at every moving point and rotational point on this setup, we had little motors. And then what if we controlled those motors with a computer? This way, they could program in 
the movement of the camera and they could also program in certain rotational movements on the spaceship. So they weren't going to necessarily move the spaceship, but they could rotate it on um, like, on like a, a little actuator um, mechanism that could very precisely rotate it at the same time. This way, the camera and the model, the model could be rotating, the camera could be moving and rotating, and the movements could be repeated over and over again. And this allowed you to shoot multiple spaceships at different scales and distances and to put painted elements in the background as well, and then composite them together and they would all perfectly match up. And this is what's called motion control photography. Uh, so the camera moves just as much as the models. The camera moves way more than the models. Every time you see, um, for example, that, that example shot I did, I showed of Return of the Jedi, where we're skimming over the surface of the Death Star. Um, the Death Star is a static model and the camera is moving across that computer controlled on a jib, very, very close with a periscope lens, sometimes called a lipstick lens. Um, so it can get really, really, really close to the model. And also the camera, the model is, uh, the camera is moving slowly at a high, um, at a slower frame rate. So the shutter's open and it's moving slowly as the camera, as the camera shutter opens quite slowly and shuts again. This way there's motion blur happening as the camera moves across the surface. And when you play it then at 24 frames per second, it feels like you're moving very, very fast. And then all the spaceships are shot separately. Now the camera isn't moving, but it remembers all of those rotational aspects. So you can say, keep the camera, camera's rotational animation, but no longer move it. Uh, and then rotate the spaceship. Don't move the spaceship, just rotate it. That way, when you layer all these things up together, they'll look like they're in the same scene as each other. And they're layered up. Before we had After Effects, before we had Photoshop, we had this thing that you can see on screen called an optical printer. So an optical printer is a series of uh, film projectors all stacked up in a line. You can kind of see there's one and there's another just here. And then at the very, very end of it is a film camera. And it's actually, I think this is the film camera just here. Um, so this is, it looks complicated. It looks kind of, techy and mechanical, but at the heart of it, it's it's very, very simple premise. And all of these different passes, like the Starfield pass, the Death Star Surface pass, the Millennium Falcon pass, would all be fed into a different projector. Because they would have been shot against a blue screen, the blue could be filtered out, providing a high contrast matte, a black and white matte, and where it was black, it was essentially transparent, so the other projector could show through. And it was like it was like Photoshop. It was like After Effects with layers, except it was a physical, real kind of thing. Um, and that's how you would then composite things together. Um, now, so all of this stuff, despite being computer controlled, is it's mechanical and exists physically. Uh, not only that, a lot of the time, because they're in America, it's in a hot environment, like uh, like in Southern California. And it's all affected, and it's it's film running fast, 24 frames per second, um, through uh, projectors and cameras. And things can heat up, and they can cool down, and, think, and metal can expand and contract, and film cannot be perfectly aligned in these, in these machines. And so things wobble, and they're out of sync. And so things kind of look... Things don't look perfect. If you freeze frame one of the Star Wars shots, you can see stuff that's kind of wrong. Um, except when I was a kid, it used to bother me a bit because I was a bit of a, oh my God, look, you can see the mistake. You can see the mat lines around the TIE fighters during um, Empire Strikes Back, whizzing through the asteroid field. Uh, but now I think it looks right. Now I love it um, because I like the fact that it's it's not quite right. It's It's, it's imperfect. And so... It has a sort of a warmer kind of feel. And I want to put that stuff into my stuff because um, it's pure nostalgia for me. I just want to I want to create the look of stuff of how I remembered it looking. And so I will go in there, of course, and bizarrely, even though I've got, even though coming straight out of 3D, things will look perfect. There will be no wobble. Everything will be perfect. I will go in and I will add that stuff. And as you can see here, what I try and do is I try and go in and I, I try and make it imperfect and add little black, Mat lines where where things kind of don't quite match up. So yeah, that, that's um that's kind of what I want to do. I want to recreate space scenes now. A middle aged 
I want to make them look how they used to look because um, it's because I do and I can and it's fun. So um, I grew up wanting to make this stuff, obviously. I'd be watching Star Wars, watching kind of Alien. Too young, but I'd watch it um, because when we finally got a video recorder, I could pester my dad to go down to um, Ritz video or Blockbuster's video and um, get us out um, an 18 certificate film. Um, bizarrely enough, it would be there's no there's no sex stuff in it, is there? No, no, no. Don't worry. It's just it's scary and violent. I'd be like, oh, okay, that's all right then. Strange standards back then, um, probably still now. Uh, but I don't want to make this kind of stuff. But I couldn't. I was too young, and I, you know, everything was made in America, or if it's down in London, near Shepperton and Bray Studios. So I wanted to make this kind of thing, and there was no way that I could see that you could study to kind of make this. So then I thought, well, I'll, I knew that I was I was also interested in computer animation. So I thought I will try and study that. And I remember seeing at school in A-levels, there was a prospectus for Bournemouth University. And Bournemouth University was the home to the NCCA, the National Center of Computer Animation. And I thought, ah, right. Well, I, there's a course you can go and study that. And I'm interested in that because I like computer animation as well. Uh, it was very difficult to get onto. There was only about, I think, a dozen places on the course each year. And you had to have a brilliant portfolio. And uh, you also had to be really good at maths as well. Um, I had a middling portfolio. And I was terrible at maths. And so I did not get on the course. I remember going down for the interview. And as part of the interview, um, before you were interviewed, you were handed out basically kind of like Mensa style tests. And you had to do all these logic puzzles and all that kind of stuff. And I just, you know, I fell apart, couldn't do it at all. Um, thankfully, though, they also had a media production course that allowed you to do a little bit of computer animation. So I decided to do that. And I found that easy to get onto because on the media course, most people wanted to be like TV directors. And not many people on the media course wanted to do anything to do animation. So I found that like, it was a nice little back door to kind of get in there to kind of uh, work uh, on CG and get access to it. And we were always given off. We were, we were given the 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 not so good computers as media production animation people. We were second class kind of citizens in, in Bournemouth when it came to animation. But I've got over it now. I did well on it. And um, uh, it was fun. But it was different from how we learn today. Uh, today, there's YouTube. Um, today, you can have a laptop and you can do this kind of stuff, especially with Blender. Um, back then, um, I remember when I finished my my BA, when we would do my BA, we had these extremely old Hewlett Packard workstations. Uh, they were still obviously more powerful than my Commodore Amiga that I had at home. Um, but then when I did my MA, the university managed to splash out and get silicon graphics machines. And these were, these were the real deal back then. These were considered very, very, very high end. They were specific, specifically made to do things like computer animation. We had loads of these O2 machines at Bournemouth University, um, which were pretty expensive, but they weren't as expensive as the Onyx, um, which I've got written in my notes um, was as much, uh, was as pricey as a uh, mid-priced um, saloon car. Um, but then when I did my actual, when I really looked into my my research, way more expensive. This Onyx piece, um, it's not a PC, this Onyx workstation would have cost you close to a quarter of a million pounds. And that's before you've got any software on it at all. And the software would be in the tens of thousands of pounds as well. Uh, now you can go to the, uh, the computer museum in Bletchley and you can see one of these um, actually gathering black mold in the corner, completely forgotten because it's not even as interesting as something like the uh, like like a uh, a spectrum, a ZX spectrum, and a BBC Micro gets um, gets more more pride of place. This thing, I couldn't believe it when I saw it because I thought this is when I was at uni. We just thought, oh my god, you know, th this is amazing. And and the uni did manage to get one of these, but as students, we were never allowed on it. The lecturers just had it for themselves. Um, but yeah, and now now they're forgotten. Now um, now you've got more more power in in a very modestly priced laptop. Um, yeah, and of course I don't even I could spend ages and ages talking about how you even began back then as well. We the way you rendered and got stuff onto tape, 
Um, we didn't use an optical printer, but at Bournemouth University, the way to do it was that the frames would be laid down frame by frame onto a videotape using a special computer called an abacus. And you had to book time on the abacus, and it was the only way that you could get stuff from your Unix machine onto a beta uh, tape. So yeah, there you go. Um, I'm, I, I used to be a snob. So I used to be a terrible, terrible snob. Working in the industry, I can see that Adrian, who I used to work with a fair bit at Fluid Pictures, um, is here, that um, I used to be a big, big time snob. So uh, I thought Blender was rubbish purely because it was free. Can you believe that? It was like, it was like people who won't go to Audi and they'll only go to Waitrose because somehow, because Audi's cheaper, it means it's worse or something like that. I was like that. And I hate myself for that. Um, back during the, the mid to late 90s, the, the three big bits of software used for 3D animation were, um, well, they were, they were 3D Studio Max, they were Soft Image XSI, and they were Maya. Um, and these programs, they grew out of older programs. So Maya grew out of a program called Power Animator. Uh, made by I think Alias Wavefront and uh, and another and an advanced visualizer I think it was called uh, and 3D Studio Max used to be called just 3D Studio uh, and I think that was been that been owned by so many different companies I think Discrete I don't know if they originally owned it but um, and then Soft Image was owned by at one point was owned by Avid at one point it was owned by Microsoft of all people. Um, then it obviously got bought by Autodesk. But these were the big programs that were used in the games industry, in the film industry, and in TV and kind of commercials. And you kind of normally, you knew one, maybe you knew, you knew two, and they were used everywhere. And Blender's actually older than these bits of software. Uh, but I thought it was free, and I thought, yeah, I thought if it's free, how can it be good if it's free, you know? Um, but, you know, and to be honest, you know, it took a while for it to get really good. but you know, it was there was a snooty attitude towards it. I don't think it was just me. I remember working through studios and um, colleagues had a snooty attitude to it as well. Um, Blend uh, Blender was released in um, 1995 by Dutch animation studio called Neo Geo. Um, nothing to do with the console um, made by uh, the SNK games console, but it was their in-house animation uh, sort of software, and then they released it. Uh, it took. It was a year later that uh, Maya and Soft Image kind of came out. Uh, although Maya beat Soft Image to the release date, I remember I was in. I was a student volunteer at SIGGRAPH in New Orleans. I remember people talking. People, everyone was a buzz about how how um, Maya and Soft Image were going to come out, or XSI. It was going to be. It was called. It's still kind of called fondly by some people, and. Um, Soft Image was like a kind of almost six months to a year late. Um, basically, Maya got got there first and got in the pipelines of lots of the major studios. Um, and I whether that whether that repercussion was always felt and and you know poor old Soft Image's destiny was written back then. Who knows? Um, Soft Image was discontinued by Autodesk. They killed it. They didn't even release it. You know, just as sort of like free. Then when they then they when they killed it they killed it, and a lot of softies as we used to call ourselves, are still quite raw about that. Um, but anyway, Blender is a bit older. Um, Blender is free, and um, it's been gradually getting better and better and better. And I think it's a case of a bit like the tortoise and the hare. Uh, it it just took its time, and now it's at the point where um, if I want to do something quickly and I want it to look good, I would go to Blender rather than go to Maya. I'm sure um, being, um, I don't know whether Adrian would, would agree with me uh, as being a, being soft and marge was used um, a lot at Fluid that, um, and then when we were, everyone was forced to use Maya, <laughs> all the soft and marge people go in, I'd, I'd rather use, I'd rather use a, a a dirty pooey stick than use Maya to make something. But I think that now, if I want to make something quick, I would use Blender over Maya. I'd use Blender over 3D Studio Max as well. Um, I think there are things set up in Blender that just, um, that things are just tuned and dialed in so that you can get stuff out of it quicker and easier. Um, 
and uh, yeah and 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 now it's now it can do pretty much everything it can it can simulate you can obviously model and animate in it you can simulate in it you can use uh, procedural kind of modeling techniques it's uh geometry nodes uh, now have simulation in it's beginning to feel like uh, a little bit more like ice that used to have in soft image and uh, you know it's trying to obviously be a little bit more like houdini um doesn't yet have that kind of uh, power or depth but uh it's kind of getting there for sure. Um, you can composite stuff in Blender, and the compositor is perfectly good. Um, you can even do you can do all your 3D tracking in Blender if you want to do it. Uh, you can edit stuff. You can treat it like a nonlinear editor. Um, and um, some I've seen some person has even turned it into a digital audio um, workstation, a door. So yeah, you can do a lot of stuff with it. When I started out teaching concept art at Staffs, um, we did not use Blender. We used Maya, and it actually took students to get me onto Blender and realize that we should use it. Um, they were showing me stuff. They were they were super enthusiastic about it, and they were showing me what other people could do. And um, and then I began realizing, of course, that concept artists like it a lot as well because because it's free. Um, it has a relatively easy kind of way of learning it. There's a ton of resources out there. Um, you don't have to read these thick manuals like you have to, used to have to do in the olden days. Um, so uh, yeah, and then I started using it. And once I got past the initially quirky way of moving around it, um, it clicked. And now I'll just use it for everything. I'll use it because I just like using it. And it's fun. Um, that's a lot of preamble. And so I don't have a huge amount of time left to do the technical part of it. But I will try and do it. So um, I'll also just show you um, some of the stuff that I do kind of now. So this is um, some spaceship stuff. It's also got some what I would call what we call beacon codes. So these are codes that we use to do registers at Staffordshire University. And I thought, can I do one and then make it adaptable so I can change it each morning so it's ready for each lesson? And so you'll see some of those at the end. So you'll see there's a, a lot of slow camera moves, maybe too slow in this case, but I like it nice and slow. So you can actually have a look at the environment. Obviously, sound makes a huge difference as well. Um, and I will rip sound from some of my favorite sci-fi kind of films. Uh, then I'll also record my own kind of sound, um, bizarrely enough, with my mouth, like that guy from Police Academy. If you are from the 80s and you watch the Police Academy movies, I'll do a bit of that and then treat it. There'll also be things like Quixel, Megascan assets, especially for environmental kind of stuff, because that's the quickest easiest way. Um, I also use this. This was an exercise to try and get the water looking nice. This uses a trick used in Alien. There are literally mirrors. There's only a tiny one section of corridor and I use completely reflective objects to make it look like the corridor is infinite. I'm going to talk about the um, the people in a moment. Stardust, about how I make that. And the short answer is I use Mixamo. A lot of stuff though, this is a, a complete homage to uh, aliens. And I was really studying what the model looked like, the, the levels, when things, when the blacks were crushed, so to speak, how much specularity there kind of was going on. I do a lot of that because I think that's part of the look. I can also recommend Polyhaven. Or a lot of nice uh, environmental kind of backgrounds. They do some nice mountains and stuff like that. A lot of this is camera moves and the choreography and the lighting of it. Backlight your stuff. Don't let things get completely black. Always have a little bit of light in that blackness.
These are a beacon logos. So the challenge with this, so the, the gun barrels in Blender, then there's a lot of stuff in After Effects. So the challenge with these kind of beacon codes is can I can I have enough pre-render that I can quickly recreate one each morning? And also I just love film logo beginnings and, and how they're treated and how they're tweaked and kind of changed. And I just think, um, you know, like Martin Scorsese meme, this is cinema. This is really, really cheaty as well. So the first part is the bit I've done, and then I kind of segue into the actual type of sequence from the Matrix. Um, and then I'm going to segue back out of it into the bit that I made, where you see kind of my face made up of kind of Matrix kind of code just here. All the matrix stuff here is all done in um, all done in the shader. There's no there's no actual geometry at all. One of the advantages with Blender, it's got EV as a real-time renderer, so I can also render it super, super, super quick. Okay, then. There we go. Let's then switch to uh, Blender. Here was something I was playing around with earlier, and I'll show you kind of how I begin to make sort of something like this. So we'll start with a brand new scene. Um, there's many different ways of doing this, I think. Um, occasionally, I will sketch something. Um, and I do have a sketchbook um, it's downstairs, actually, at the moment. But yeah, I have a sketchbook, and I will doodle kind of spaceshipy kind of ideas. And I'll sometimes use that as inspiration. A lot of the time, I'll just do it. I'll just start off with the default cube and do something kind of to it to start making uh, a spaceship. Sometimes I will, and then I'll add kind of greebles on top of it. Sometimes I will um, I will use whole greebly kitbashy things together, and I'll just I will batch them together to create new kind of kind of looks. But what I like to do sometimes is have setups like this. I use symmetry a lot, and I like to have a setup where um, I will take something else out. You know, I'll just end up with something as simple as that. I'll put uh, some I'll put a mirror modifier on it, um, and I will use a bicep modifier. I'm using a an add-on for Blender called uh, Hardot that allows me that does a lot of this kind of stuff quickly and easily to adding adding mirror modifiers and other things. So I can quickly add um, something like a um, a solidify, and then I'll quickly add uh, a bevel bevel modifier that gets added to everything, and um, and that way I can kind of go in here. And I can begin to sort of come up with shapes for stuff. And then as I continue to add stuff, it will always add on just like a lot like 3D Studio Max. It's like a modifier stack, basically. Hardups just does it in a kind of slightly clever way. Like it will always keep your bevel at the bottom no matter what you kind of add. So, And you want your bevel added to the end result. So we can kind of just, I can just deal with a simple kind of shapes and block something out like this maybe. And then I will use another add-on um, called a box cutter, which is again is like a very fancy way of applying booleans. Maybe actually I might take something like that. I might kind of move it out a bit. Actually, I'm going to undo a bunch of stuff here and get rid of that that bevel and move this out so that my bevel here just looks a bit nicer. I think. 
So we've got something like this, and then I might um, take this maybe. Let's go this out. And I'll use bull tool to cut things in and out. So um, bull tool is really, really nice. It's got a lot of it's, – it's a bit overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff in it that initially takes a lot of getting used to. Blender is a very – a very uh, sort of keyboard shortcutty way of working, and a lot of the add-ons that you can get for it work in that kind of way as well. They kind of do require you to do a little bit of memory, um, but it is worth it because after a while you can you can speed up quite a lot. So I like to do a lot of this kind of stuff, and then I think a lot of hard surface stuff, especially spaceship stuff, should look like it's got panels. And you see the advantage of having bevels on means that I can cut into things and it looks like this has been cut into like this. And then you always want to add things like little sort of indentations that sort of push inwards like that. I can hit W to turn this into a wedge. And I can get little moments like that. The shading's getting a little bit screwy here because you've been dealing with a lot of booleans and a lot of um, uh, bevels on top. So we can go in and we can fix the fix that or we can try to fix it with a weighted normal modifier that just normally helps out with that we can do things like and um, take this one maybe and we can maybe into it like this we'll change this back like that we can bevel it maybe and then maybe we can turn this into a kind of slice like this um what i like to do also what else could we do we can do and we can maybe cut into it like this. Actually, I'm going to quit out of that and then change the projection mode. By default, um, box cutter will go on the top of here. I'm running out of time here. So what I can do is I can project it like this instead. And cut through and then maybe um, turn this into that kind of thing. And then maybe array it like this. Get it right and something like that. I can build stuff up like that. Um, what I can do then is I could uh, we can put some greebles on it. So we can go to the my my assets just here. I've got loads of assets just here. Some of them made myself. Some I've got over time, and I can just um, well, I don't want to go to full ships. I want to go to greebles like this, and I want to start placing stuff directly on it. So I might put something like that on and that will just instantly sort of snap to that surface. I want to want it mirrored on the other side. So I'll have that selected, select any middle object and um, and then, then I can have that swap to the other side like that. Maybe I could throw a material on this. This asset pack comes with a really nice material. It's actually quite simple, uh, but it looks good. So I can go in maybe and I can apply this kind of metal Border patrol metals kind of sheeting, and then when we look at it like this, got kind of that kind of look. Um, so this is how kind of greebling kind of works. You just build it up. One of the things I think is really important to do with this kind of work is to stack things up. If you're doing spaceships, you want to uh, want to sort of select objects, maybe shift and uh, D and duplicate them, and then we can smart apply, and then move it just here, and then scale it like this. And I think. That kind of, I think when you're designing stuff, I think it's important that we do this. We have overlaps. Um, this creates nice stuff here. You can put extra little lights and extra little greebles in here to make it kind of look um, prettier as well. And I'll build up my spaceships, kind of like that. Um, other things that I can do uh, is, let me see if I can just do this before I jump into After Effects. So I think it's important that I show you some of the After Effects stuff is that sometimes you want to really change and you want to deform stuff so if i go to maybe whole parts and i bring in something like that um i want to bend this around but it won't bend because it's modeled fairly nicely for what it is but it doesn't have the subdivision in and you couldn't just put a subdivision mod uh, modifier onto this because it would screw up so you actually want to dice it and again this is where this hard ops comes in really useful i can dice dice it basically project a whole series of cuts through it this way and now I can make it, I'll be able to make it bend basically. 
So now it's got these kind of cuts going, going through it. And we can um, do things like the twist array tool, and we can create stuff like this. So we can create one piece and create like a bit of a space station kind of ring or something like that, however you kind of want to make it. Um, I do a lot of this, so I'll use that then. Now this is, you know, I've used a hub part from a spaceship, but now I've created kind of a super techy looking um, sort of part just here. It's not lit very well because the light, if I put it on sun, it'll be too bright. So I put it like that and you can see, you can create elements like this. And I like to stack stuff up um, layer upon layer upon layer. Um, right, so um, I've only got 10 minutes left, so I'll be super quick. Then I'll bring it into After Effects, uh, and I'll layer all this stuff up, um, and, I'll, and I will treat it a lot like um, a real kind of optical printer. So we will deal with um, the, the Earth, and then I'll need to put glow on the Earth. This, this Earth is not a complete sphere. It's just a um, slightly curvy kind of plane with aerial photography just mapped onto it. But it's very important that we put glows on this so that it begins to look more earthy. Because it's quite low res as well. It's just a tiling bit of aerial photography on this. Um, then we'll put the spaceship on. The spaceship, that's how it looks straight out of Blender, but I, I need to make it so it's not so pitch black. So I need to lift all the black levels up. So we've got this slight blue light and black level. I think it's super important to kind of have this. Um, I got this um, from observation, but also I felt validated when I watched Dennis Muren once talk about how um, he was telling his CG artists on th even things like the abyss that with the renders coming out of it were looking too CG. And part of that is that the black levels were, there was too much range in the black levels and the black levels went all the way down to pure black. Lift those black levels up, crush them a little bit, compress them and tint them. And you'll instantly get something looking a bit more kind of filmy. Um, so then we've got lens track, because I track the lenses, to add in these um, lens flares at the end. So these lens flares are just taken from texturelabs.com, an amazing free website with a ton of free textures on. So I tracked the glowy part of the spaceship, uh, which is easy to do in After Effects. You just literally put a null over it and go track. And then I can attach just some photographic elements of lens flares that are set to screen. And then I put a little bit of, um, I put a wiggle controller, which wiggles the intensity and also rotates them a little bit as they're moving through the screen as well. You can buy whole proper fancy add-ons to do lens flares. Um, or if you don't want to pay for that, you can just do cheap hacky ways and just throw a still image of a real lens flare over the top. The black and white scratches are super important. They're very difficult to see when they're just added in this kind of way um, because um, they're very, very subtle. You can see the tiny bits just here, and they're just going to add. You can see it actually more in the presentation right at the beginning. Um, so a mouse cursor has disappeared like it sometimes does. Oh, my God. Here we go. I guess if I play that um, from the current slide. No, not the current slide. Ah. Play that from the current slide. You'll see, you'll get this feeling every now and then there's little flickers and scratches, and there's a lot of noise as well. Um, again, you, people will, um, you can buy footage packs of um, scratches and stuff like that to get this, but you can do it in After Effects um, just procedurally, super easily. Um, what you do is you add a solid. It doesn't matter what color the solid is at all. Um, and then you add a fractal noise to it. So where did I put that solid? Just here. So fractal noise looks like this to begin with. You just got to change some settings. So you change, you want a really high contrast fractal noise. Uh, and then you want... Um, very, very low brightness, minus 260, and you hardly see it. Um, and then what we're going to do is you animate the evolution with a wiggle controller. And wiggle controller just puts random numbers into things. So we can hold down Alt, hit the keyframe for evolution, and then we can type in um, wiggle brackets 24, because we want it to be changing um, once every frame in a second. And then a really high number, 
30,000 or something like that. And then what this will do then is just give you a different random seed for every frame. Every, you can see it flicker slightly just there. And this fractal noise, when it's contrasted up that much, looks a bit like dust on the lens. Uh, and then you just apply it as a screen so that none of the black gets seen, but only the white bits get seen. And then this will flicker. And then I do the same thing. I just duplicate the layer and do an opposite. Um, so instead of minus 260, I'll do 260. And that will give me uh, black dust as well. And I'll multiply that. And then I have a load of um, blur. One of the things I'll always do is I'll put a tiny little bit of chromatic aberration. Don't put too much. Don't put too much. Otherwise, it looks too cheesy. It's a bit like the lens flare of uh, the um, the 20, 2010s and 2020s that chromatic aberration is. Put a little bit of chromatic aberration and then put a bit of blur and then weirdly and counterintuitively put a bit of sharpening after you've put the blur. This will just do something lovely. It will soften the image, but then it'll then contrast up the edges again. It'll just give you this filmy kind of look essentially. And then I will put um, lookup tables as well. Lookup tables, if you don't know what they are, um, they are basically Instagram filters. Um, real colorists would go for my throat if I said that, uh, but they are kind of like Instagram filters. <laughs> so you can make your stuff kind of look um, nicer uh, with that as well. It will do sort of stuff. It will also kind of tie a lot of these elements to kind of together as well. Uh, and um, and then, yeah, I'll put loads of grain on it. I'm almost completely running out of time. And then what I like to do is I like to fake it, make it look like it was actually filmed against a blue screen. I got this idea from a uh, Danish um, guy. In fact, the guy who came up with the kit bash set that I'm using here, um, uh, Rasmus. And uh, he likes to pretend as well that his stuff was made, actually made. And it's quite easy to do because just use a HDRI and then you just put fake blue screen stuff. Uh, and you do the same thing. You run through the same kind of filters to make it look soft. And I've got little lens things here. You often see this in behind the scenes, making ofs and things like that. And I'm running completely out of time. And then that's what the actual thing kind of looks like. So it's just camera kind of moves. Thank you for watching this. Sorry, that I'm probably going to make it difficult for the next person. You'll have to start super, super quick. Um, I hope that I am. <laughs> hope you got something out of it. And um, uh, yeah. Contact me on social media. Um, there are more talks going on. Make sure you watch all the other talks. There are about loads of other different kind of things. Um, I think Ben and Jamie are going to tell you more about those. And I yeah. um, hope you have a lovely Christmas. And um, I'll see you later. Bye. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Ant, for uh, bringing a uh, really awesome uh, perspective um, to um, Blender and the VFX industry. Um, and thank you, everyone, for uh, coming and participating and asking questions. Really awesome to see your process and um, kind of to see the the journey that you, you've been on with it. Um, you know, I I grew up a lot um, with with Alien, um, so this was was really exciting for me um, for me to watch to see how you've um, you know, replicated the the just the methods and the way they did it, but using modern solutions for it and how you've had to um, add imperfections. On yeah. top, I thought that was that was really interesting. It was really fascinating. So, uh, up next, we do have it's actually Jamie who's doing a talk next. Oh, cool. um, so, um, we'll see you all um, at at one o'clock. It's in two minutes over the next talk. So, again, and thank you very much My pleasure. Um, um, for the thank talk for and for the insights. You're welcome, and everyone have a have a fantastic day. Goodbye. Bye bye.